Well, it's totally awesome fishing time again. This time I'm down at Berry Hill Fisheries. I'm on their main lake, but listen, I'm not sort of, I am going fishing, but I'm sort of thinking about it a little bit longer. Now, match fished on that side, match fished on this side. That's the two regular spots that they do match fishing on. I'm thinking, well, where does most of that bait go? If I was a bream, and that's my target species bream, where would I be? I want to be regularly traveling or patrolling the route that the bait's going in at. So I'm going to go into the little tackle kiosk here and ask our man who sells the tackle what length pole he reckons we should be fishing at. I'm not pole fishing, but pole anglers in a match are very accurate. They leave that bait in the, in the same sort of space, which I won't retain the same accuracy, but I might be able to target that area a little bit more efficiently. See what he has to say. Hi Graham, you're on the old lake today at Berry Hill. Um, I've advised you to try pegs 37, 38, um, opposite the island on the long bank. Um, you'll, you'll be able to catch on a pole length, probably 13 to 14 and a half metres. Nice light rig, size 18 hook, double red maggot, size 16 hook, piece of corn. Corn's good, yeah, like corn, corn, yeah. yeah, corn. Yeah, corn works very well there, Graham. Um, soft hooker pallets, which we've yeah. got a good selection of here. Lovely lot of soft hookers. Um, you'll catch on double, treble maggot on a 16 as well. A little, little bit of feed? Just yeah, a little bit of ground bait, like tiny little balls of ground bait. Um, you'll also along there, you'll catch on a waggler and also you'll catch on a feeder casting over to the island to the there's a little um, row of rhododendrons yeah right on the end of the island and you'll be fishing sort of like a couple of meters short of that okay again double red maggot on a method feeder or a cage feeder sweet corn um, sometimes two grains of sweet corn will pick the bigger the bigger bream out um, sort of five to six pounders maggot will attract the smaller fish um, most of the matches that we have along that bank there yeah. are more or less dominated 90% of the time by pegs 37 and 38. Okay, okay, well, it's empty at the moment so I better get down there. But they fish sometimes, I've seen them using poles, as they call it, a whip on the inside, you wouldn't use that. So what length is, you, you say that length again? I'd probably the average, go, length. Av average, average length that a lot of the match guys fish up here is about 13 metres. So 13 metres, if I peg it out, measure it, yep. and then cast to that, I'm aiming that most of the fish might be moving they along that area. Well be there on the match line, yeah. Best thing I do is get down there. Oh, I don't like this hill, I'm gonna have to level that out. Now one of the first things you gotta do when you come here is like so many places, as the sign says, dip all nets before starting the fish. Now this is due, as I understand it, to various viruses going around fisheries. It has been for a long time, but one of which I think is KHV, which I think stands for Koi Herpes Virus, which is particularly effective on carp. And it, like, oh, let's get that over there. I think it's actually born from the fact that somebody released, say, aquatic koi into water. Now when I dip my net, look, I slide all this up here and then it goes underneath, soaking wet. And let the worst of it dry out and then obviously your net dissolves. <laughs> I've no idea what's in there, but it won't be going in my flask of tea. I just put it there to drain for a second. So guys, make sure you do all these dipping where it says dipping where these tanks are and your wasteling. I'm going to come back and do the wasteling. You run hooking mat, anything like that and it just keeps the fish there for future time. Now look, I'm gonna let those dry because I'm really, really close to the uh, top of the fishery here. Never fished this bit before except for sand. I've fished here for sand. I've never carp fished here before and I've never bream fished. In fact, I've never fished this area other than for sander. Smallest platform, not a double platform. Ordinarily, I'd be wanting to fish right on the corner of that there uh, willow, hanging willow. If I fish carp, I feel it's gonna be in there. I might chuck baits over here, I don't know yet. And let's see, most of the guys will be casting tight up the edge, but Ian in the tackle shop said, just go mid, mid channel where it's slightly deeper. Right, I've got to sort all this out somehow. I don't understand how we have to have all this gear. It is sort of beyond belief. It's going to get my nets a bit dry now. What you do is just slide your net back up the rim there. And you don't get it all over your hands. Right, so we've heard Ian tell us of the distance. 13 metres, you had to write it down for me because I just kept forgetting. 13 metres, I'm going to call that 39 feet, I'm going to call it 40 feet. 40 feet, so if I go and spike these apart like the cat carp anglers do, I'm going to put one there. Right, so 5 eighths are 40. Let's see if I can get 8 feet. This 
is only an experiment, people. Right. Right, so that's eight feet. Then I'm going to cast out after I've measured up and down here five times with my feeder rod. So five eighths are 40. It's a measure of the man there. <laughs> I've got a bit of ground bait. Got a bit of everything, actually, is the truth of it. This stuff is about three years old. It's a paste. I don't know, it's Japanese or Chinese, so I, I can't... I can't read it. Whatever it is, it's been very, very good. A few floaters, a bit of salmon paste there. And a bit of ground bait here for my feeder. So I'm going to damp this now. I don't want to over damp it because I have not got any more. As we always say, you can put the water into the ground bait, but you can't take it out. This is just Bran and Bailey's feed. It's not shop bought ground bait, it's just one I make up myself. And generally, if I use without Bran, it will go really, really pretty, gluey. Good for rivers for barbel fishing, that's why I like it. That's probably why I buy it by the sack. I wish I could catch barbel by the sack now, so I need to be getting more and more hard. Right, I can let that. I'm just going to let that soak up while I get my rod set up. I'm going to be using a quiver tip, two quiver tip rods, just for now. Cast out there, I might even put put them on buses so I see what I feel. Just how the uh, how the day takes me, or what's left of the day. It's now ten past one and I don't even have a bait in the water. Right, Avon rod, fixed ball reel, five, six pound line. Here, a size 12 barbless hook about 10 inches of, I don't know, about three pound line. A pretty manky knot, but it's a blood knot. We'll hold with a big tag in, but don't worry about it. Swivel, my main line here, a buffer bead, which we never had years ago, but now apparently it's all the fashion to use. Goes over the knot and it stops when casting. That swivel eye comes up against that rather than rubbing it against the knot. So it sort of makes sense. Small opening cage feeder. But first, I'm gonna actually fill it for the ground bait because that's what I'm going to cast, and I'm going to measure my distance. I'm not going to put any bait on yet. I'm just going to put a bit of feed in there. Right. This is the experiment. It's the big experiment, people. Carp anglers do it all the time for accuracy. This is just for me trying to maintain an area that I believe the matchman average on average fish at. So you put your you put your hook bait, say there, and you go around this, five eighths or 40, look, once. I'm letting the line come off the spool here. Twice. Around the bushes. Go around there. Once you've got this, you've got it, you know. Three times. Four times. So five times, this is there. Okay, so I'm just gonna hook it under that edge of the rod breast and I'm going to let the line spill off because I know that's a five so there here I'm going to wind that to the tip ring <coughs> so it's just here down through until I get it on the spool here and then on the spool I know where that is I can see it I just take that off there's a line clip a line clip just there you're going to tuck it in there and that's my distance So if I just tuck that, you might have to put your nail in there. Now this is almost impossible to do filming and fishing. To do it on your own is easy. So if I put the rod there and just lean that, I tuck it under there, look. Now what happens is, I can wind over the top of that like this, but when I cast, it's all for beginners, we're only doing this for beginners. I take all my line back here, back to where I've got my bait, around my two rod rings, oh rod rest, sorry. Now there, there's my bait. <clears throat> now I'm ready to cast now, but when I cast, it will stop against that line, stop so it won't overcast. And that's as near as I can get to maximum accuracy today. So you'll see it. Now, another little tip is when you cast, just keep the rod high so there's not some big snatch on top of the, uh, when you get the impact of coming to the end. So I love it out. Bosh, it stops down here. So that is about the distance of maximum fish. 
I'll show you again. I can almost do this underhand to be honest, but it's more accurate just like this. There, that's their pole length. Now you can see where I'm here. Obviously a match will be set about here with the pole. So I don't want to move it any more than that, just here. Okay. So there you can see it. I can then take this off. Obviously if I hook a big fish, it's going to come up against that, it might snap. I take that off, but each time I want to reset that distance, I just go over to my two pegs here and loop it around the peg five times. Then I know I'm going to retain that accuracy. Next thing is, get some hook baits out there and some bait out there. I'm going to mix all my sweet corn in amongst that. You can put maggots if you want, but I'm going to be using a sweet corn on one and probably a banded pellet on the uh, on the other rod. I've cast over the hook bait. I'm going to put it up high like this. I'm going to arrange myself in a minute so we can see that quiver tip. Put the rods around here. Move all this all this junk out of the way. Look at it. Rubbish, rubbish, rubbish. Where do we? Where do we get it all from? Now if I put my chair around this way, I'm looking up there against the sky and I can see, I'll show you as close as I can get without falling in the water. You can see the quiver tip there and what I'm looking for is any sort of pull round like that. Let's get the other rod out. So there's a feeder. There's a single grain of sweet corn. And we just get that on the 13 meter mark there. Let it sink. I like to sink and then I just give it this look. One pop just to let the ground bait pull out behind. Bring it back and put it just slightly inside the other tip like I always do. So there's one here, one like this, they're not level, one's like this, one like that. Just tighten up. That's it, and just sit back and wait. What a setting. A little bit of windy over there, probably if I was carp fishing I would go over there. <clears throat> and that looks very good for Wagner folk fishing for roach or bream just off the end of that fallen tree. That's a nice feature. But of course here at Berry Hill, anything could come at any time. Right, I'm going to catapult some bait out because I've seen the shadow line here exactly where that 30 metre area is. So I'm going to put a few balls of ground bait in. I can see exactly where I've been casting by the reflection got my sweet corn, I've got all the balls. Now when you throw in balls out, either by catapult or by hand, when you mix them up in here, I find it's easier to try and keep them all the same size like that. If you can keep them all at the same size, then it's much easier and you get much more accuracy when you're throwing. So I'm sort of aiming for about three or four foot square, just out there. And what I also find is, if you get uh, those concentric circles spreading out, that gives you an accuracy. So if you follow up, aiming for that like a bullseye of where the first ball went in, you can go either side of it or you can try and get it into the same bullseye. So rather than wait a long time, I try and put three, four, five balls in at the same time because the splash of the first one, the rings it makes, tells me roughly you know, what to aim for with the second one. I've also had a bit of result because the last angler of the swim dropped these, his bands, but the banded pellets. That's just what I need. I've got three banded pellets, three. It's getting better all the time. So I've refilled the feeder there. And now I'm going to put what they call a banded pellet on. That's using one of these tools here that expands. You get one of these little bands. 
be fun trying to get this one out. You place it very carefully over the end of these four prongs on this tool. Hopefully you guys will see it. Just like we do for bubble fishing. Then you push you push the plunger here. It, you take your pellet. Slide it in like this. I hold the band while I slide it off. Just like this. Hopefully you can see this guys. Don't know with this small camera what exactly you see. There's no monitor. Then I put the hook underneath the band. Now some people actually put the hook through the rubber band. I find that weakens it a bit. So let's get that one out there. So there's my feeder. You can see here, there's the feeder. There's the pellet. Let's get that out and see if that does any good. So I've got one on corn and one on pellet. There we go. Just pop it once. Walk it back because I could sit there but close up. It doesn't really matter, doesn't it? It's just a bit of an experiment because but let's face it, those those bream with the matchman, they're all in a row here. They're, I'm aiming that, to think that they're going up and down here looking for food. And that's what I'm thinking. And I'll get myself just balance here like this. One outside the other one. And just if you can see up there, just watch those two tips like that. See if we can't get a bream out of it. The last of the sun is going round up there. Very pleasant it is too. I would like to see just this, just small fish. Boys, I'm hooked up. Mouthful of crisps going everywhere. Feels like a decent fish. I've already lost two bites talking to one of the other uh, fishery managers to come around. This one is a nice bream. And that's what I came for. This one is on the sweet corn. At the moment, the three bites I've had in this fish have been on the sweet corn. If I get this fish, I'll show it to you. Smith, where you put the net? Come on, man, where have you put the net? God alive. The reason I think the sweet corn is good, this is a nice bream. Better get him in, this is two grains. Is because the matchmen use sweet corn a lot. Yeah, the matchman uses sweet corn quite a lot. That's barbless for you. That's fallen out. Got my other line, but saw that in a minute. Gonna show you this fish. Oh yeah. This is where you come to old Berry Hill or Berry Hill fish, which we call it now. A nice bream there. Target achieved. And do you know what? I think that line we're on is the matchman. I'm gonna call it the matchman's line. What do you think? Let's get this guy back. Get myself hosed off from the slime. Yuck. It's everywhere. I've had a couple of other taps, not a great deal. But listen, I'm trying to do an overnight one here is for carp as well as this bream one. Do the bream during the daytime. I'm going to do sort of part two, if you like, it's like a part two, and try and stay for carp overnight. <clears throat> I think it was James. Fishery guy came around talking to me and he spotted a couple out there. I had trouble seeing them at that distance, but he said they are out there, but generally when it's dark, it's better for the carp. So I can fish these bream rods, but I can throw a carp rod out here as well. And I've seen a couple of dimples move at about 45 yards out there. And even though I know there's not much chance, I'm tempted, tempted just to throw it out in case while I'm doing the bream story. And the wind is howling. What a good job. I didn't go sea fishing. Carp, well, in case you want to know, it's the second hand one I picked up for about 15 pounds. I won't say the mate, but it's a 12 foot medium range carp, two and a quarter pound test curve, two piece. 12 feet, quite long, I suppose. Maybe it's average for carp, but real. It's just called a 6000 FS Black. Really good line on it. I'm trying to think whose line it was, I can't remember now. Mike got it, years old, been very, very good. So I think I'm going to throw a boilie out there and just see if we can't get lucky, maybe with a pop-up or something like that, because I have seen one or two bits of movement while I'm waiting for the bream, which apparently have gone quiet. Okay, so here is the rig. We're gonna throw out as a bonus rod on the side for carp. It has 
a length of, I'm going to call it cord, it's not cord, but just for beginners and numb fishermen, a piece of cord along there, which I've tied my fishing line. It's got a flat weight, fishing weight there, with a hole right through the middle of it. It's a swivel here, and then my hook link to the hook which is exposed, because you can see it's a boily, a hard bait. This is a very, very hard rod. I'll tell you what it is, it is, I was told this is a tip-off because I spent a night, I think it was with my mic down at, uh, I think it was Tobba, Tobba Manor, uh, another fishery, and problems with the crayfish. You wind up in the morning, wake up in the morning, you wind in, and there's nothing on the hook, but there's no boilies. So they've now come up, I think, with this extra super hard boilie. This one is called Pacific Tuna. It's an 18 mil hard hook bait, and it's for not getting chewed and nibbled away. So I'm gonna be using that just purely because it's a nice big size. So what you do is, where that's running, you just pinch that into the lead there like that. It's laying on the lake bed like this. You cast out. I'm going to have a bag of free samples here. Let me show you so all the beginners know. Made up of a PVA. That means it dissolves in water. A PVA mesh bag with some bait in it and some sample hook baits. These are different ones. Who knows what they are? They are. They're a bit of tell you somebody want to know. Peaches and cream. Now I've caught on peaches and cream here before, but I'm just going to throw this one out with the extra super hard boilie there. So when a fish hooks itself, you can play it like normal. It comes in, it sucks this up, bosh, tries to blow it out. He can't really blow it out because the hook just hangs there. He picks up that line. As he moves away, that weight tugs on him, just holds the hook in place and he bolts. So it's called a bolt rig. And hopefully you get a hook up at this end. You should do. It's pretty sort of idiot proof, really. For beginners, it's absolutely ideal because the fish just hooks itself. It's not all, you don't even have to fish almost. Just, we could just bait up, do it properly, cast out, everything else, just wind it in. But it is very, very, very effective. So you've got the principle of it. When a fish does snag up and get broken off, hopefully it doesn't, but if it does, it can pull this free and then the line comes right out and the lead just stays on the lake bed. It's a safe rig. So it just pops in and out, just under a little tension there. So what I do is with mine, where the hook's loose like this, I get my bag, my little shopping bag here of goodies. I'm going to put a couple of hook points through that once or twice, just through the mesh. Do not do this with wet hands, it will dissolve, it falls everywhere. We've showed it before in our carp films. So all this dissolves around my hook bait, if that makes sense. So I'm going to cast it out there and just going to sit there for however long I want. It should sit there for a very long time because it's extra hard boily. Right, make sure you do not get it wet. So there's the rig, this is going to get cast out. The fish I've seen moving have been about 40, 50 yards out there, so I'm just going to basically but I strangle myself on the mic, heave it out there and leave it. I'm using the end of the island as my mark. Nothing overhead and wang. It goes, bosh, where it goes. Now that's going to dissolve. So I haven't moved it at all. I think I'm going to tighten up and sink the line like this. So between here and the bait is in a straight line. It's not in a big belly with the wind. Right, take a second, just tugging away till it sinks. It sinks. I've got my reel drag like this. I'm just checking my reel drag because I've got to set the hook at distance. Well, I don't set the hook, it's set, to be honest. I back it off and I put it down here. So I'm just going to put the rod down here. I'll just show you before I set up. I've got an audible bite alarm here. Look, when I lay it down there, the line goes across a little contact. There, it's a bite indication. I've also got an attachment at the back. We call it a bait runner. So if you ideally, if you let that rod down, if you've got to take, it's going to disappear the rod. This way, your drag is set on strike for hooking the fish, but by releasing this little lever at the back, it can pull off under pressure and just maintain that hook hold until you can grab the rod. I'm going to put it down there. Like that, and then I'm going to put a little bob in here to give me a bit of a drop back indication in case that carp picks a bait up and comes towards me. I would never know if I didn't have a bob in there. So for my bob, and I've got a washing up bottle top. I've drilled a hole through there so the line goes through there. 
and I've got some Play-Doh, or what we used to call old school, plasticine. There's extra weight in there. And that I just pop around here. That just rests there. And then I back a little bit of pressure off it like that. And then if a fish does bring the lead towards me, that's going to drop back like that. And I'll know I've got what they call a slack line bite as well. This is all just a bonus while I'm bream fishing. I might get lucky. Back to the bream. Okay, the carp rod, the bonus rods, cast out there. I'm going to leave it out there probably a couple of three hours. I'm not going to bait up any more out there. Um, it's just got that little pouch of bait on top of my hook bait. Might be a chance, might not. Uh, one tip on t tensioning or tightening up those quiver tips up there. As you can see, and maybe against the skyline, I've got a nice curve in there. Well, you can do that. You can adjust them by turning the handle of the reel like this. You might find you can get a better refined adjustment just by turning the spool either up or down. In other words, releasing tension or applying tension, depending whether you're winding the line on the reel or off the reel. That will either tense up or relax. And of course, don't forget to allow for the wind, which puts a belly in the line as well. So sometimes I don't tighten up too much. I do it slack and let the wind take the rest of the tension on the quiver tip. Well, I'm on again, guys. It's taken me a while. I've had to put my, had to put my sweat on, but it's my totally awesome sweatshirt, so it's lucky. I went down to single grain of sweet corn this time. I've been getting bites and bites and bites, and I just can't seem to uh, connect with them. Fingers crossed we get one out this time. Come on, boy, you can do it. Yes, that's a bream. In you come. Got him, got him, got him. That's good. Well, might be a single grain of sweet corn. It could be just the fact it's getting late in the afternoon, which is when you would expect to get the fish. Was it indeed the lucky sweatshirt? Or is it just pure angling skill? Either way, another chunky bream of Berry Hill. Back on again, people. I think it's single grain of sweet corn. It does seem to be on that line there. I don't think it's quite such a bit. It's still a decent bream. Listen, they all count. Nothing on the carp, but fairly quiet over on the other side, I see. He's in. He is in. There we go. It is indeed that bonus rod. Got it sorted out from the other rods. It is a carp. I'm not organised for carp, I'm bream fishing. Just thought I'd throw it out in case. I've had a bit of a mare with the, uh, with the old battery situation. So I've got something wrong with the camera, but I've still got this carp on. I'm going to see if I can at least get the camera up on my stand here. This is how I've lost so many fish over the years, trying to film at the same time, change batteries. He's now around in the rushes. I might get him out, I might get lucky. I could do with a bit of luck. Major, major result for me. People, it's the next morning. I've done my night carp fishing. I've wound a carp rod in. I've chucked the last of my bait out there from the bream session I did. And the rod nearly came out the rest. It feels like a sort of reasonable bream. You just can't give up. It's now 10 o'clock the next day. 
sunshine, warmth, I'm alive, I've emerged from my bivy life. And this just goes to show you, that is definitely some form of line that those fish are used to patrolling. So it was thanks to the awesome, totally awesome fishing show, and I'm still going. In fact, it looks like he's tangled right round that, wherever he is, there he is, there he is. I caught so many, wow, that is like a pipe, a pipe mark there. And this, this looks like the kettle is about to explode for my tea. So much definitely. Yeah, hook's falling out of that one. I just lift him out there, you see a big chunk out of him there. At the other side, all fine. Away he goes. Yes, we're going to have another cast.